Guys, before we dive on into today's video, we want to make our stance on a very important topic crystal clear. We disagree with JK Rowling and believe that trans rights are human rights. To show our support, we're attaching a fundraiser to this video in order to raise money for the Trevor Project. Here at Super Carlin Brothers, we do believe that you can separate the art from the artist. Harry Potter is a story that we have enjoyed for a very long time, but we also want to show our support to the trans community. To me, Hogwarts has taught me acceptance of everybody. And we want you to know that here in the Super Carlin Brothers community, no matter who you are, you are welcome. Hey, brother. Okay, guys. So you want to know what felt like a really unnecessary scene in The Crimes of Grindelwald? The huge set piece that is Newt's basement where we get to go inside and see him continue to care for all sorts of different creatures. And then there's this really cool epic moment where he gets on the Kelpie, like the water horse dragon spirit thing. This scene was all over the trailers and it made it feel like the Kelpie was going to be super significant to the story somehow, or there was going to be a secret passage to Hogwarts like through the water, but no, all that happens is apparently Bundy can't take care of it and it bit her finger. And so Newt has to do it and he rolls up his sleeves. It is a cool scene, but there's no payoff. It never comes back. Like was the whole thing just a gamut in order to show off Eddie Redmayne's lower forearms for a few seconds? Because if so, let me be the first to say, totally worth it. No, but seriously, I feel like one of the things that the series has executed incredibly well so far is the interactions between Newt and the beasts. But that's kind of the thing, isn't it? Like they've already showed us that. They've already made it very clear. And even in the Crimes of Grindelwald movie, there are other moments where we see that same thing happening and it has more impact on the plot. I mean, how many people can wrangle a Zowu? So I'm left to believe that somehow, some way, this must be important. And guys, I have to tell you, I think we got to the bottom of it and it's huge. Hey brother! All right, y'all, let's talk about shape-shifting. It is a concept that has been around in the world of Harry Potter for a very long time and has been used to great effect in the books. Barty Crouch Jr. hides right under Dumbledore's nose for an entire school year. The Golden Trio is able to break into Gringotts and the Ministry. Tonks makes faces at dinner once. I'm actually not totally sure why she was given this power. It's never really used in a significant way at all. Lupin is a werewolf. The Marauders and Rita Skeeter are animagi. You get the picture. It happens a lot across the seven books. But do you know where it happens even more? Fantastic Beasts, shapeshifting, and things just not being as they appear has been a huge theme across the first two movies. Grindelwald is literally transformed for the entirety of the first movie as Percival Graves. Abernathy, that guy no one wanted more of, transforms twice. I'm not really sure if it's a specific skill of his, or if he's just kind of like a lackey. Like what, what is happening here? Is it Polyjuice Potion? Is it like, is he a Metamorph Magi? Is it like body swaps? I don't get it. But speaking of Polyjuice, Newt uses it to, well, to be honest, it's kind of medium effect. When he breaks into the French ministry where he is almost immediately spotted by the person that he's impersonating. Schwoopsies! It turns out that Credence literally is the big black cloud that's tormenting New York City. Even the fact that it ultimately ends up being him and not his younger sister, Modesty, is a misdirect. Nagini can turn into a snake. The Madagots turn into harmless kittens. Dumbledore's literally teaching his class about Boggarts. Even Credence's literal physical identity was swapped with another human being and no one noticed. I mean, seriously, if you are Yusuf Kama and you put all of the information together that you put together only to find out that moments before a ship went down at sea, a little girl literally swapped the baby that was so important to you with a different baby. And now here you are standing there with that grown up little girl and the swapped baby. I mean. He's like trying to hit a bullet with a smaller bullet whilst wearing a blindfold, riding a horse. May the odds be ever in your favor. The point is Simon Pegg and Elizabeth Banks 
nailed those roles. But the pointier point is shapeshifting is incredibly important to this story and the realization of that information all of a sudden makes the Kelpie, surprisingly enough, very important. Potentially. Let me read you the entry from Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. <clears throat> The British and Irish water demon can take various shapes, though it most often appears as a horse with bulrushes for a mane. Books, am I right? Now, I would personally say that that description is kind of vague and maybe intentionally so as to not be too spoilery. I mean, after all, Zoos are left out of this book entirely and we 100% know for a fact that Newt has encountered them. But similar to the Zowu, Kelpies are not a creation of the wizarding world. They are based on a real thing in Scottish folklore. Fun fact, many people actually believe that the Loch Ness monster is a Kelpie. Funner fact, in Harry Potter, that's just canon. Less fun fact, but to be clear, in the real world, these aren't actually real. At least I'm pretty sure. The point is, they have been described in Scottish folklore dating back way before the Harry Potter series. In that realm, this is how they are described. Kelpies have the ability to transform themselves into non-equine forms that can take the outward appearance of human figures. Do you see where I'm going with this? Someone in the Fantastic Beasts series is actually a seaweed horse. But seriously, that to me, in a world where literally almost no one is ever actually who we think they are? is very important. And again, it absolutely makes me feel like that whole Kelpie scene is not just there for show. It's more like one of those like, here's a detail. I'm not gonna tell you why or how or even when it's going to be important, but eventually it will be. And when it is, you're gonna be like, oh my God, it's the thing. I would say like very similar to In Order of the Phoenix when Harry and company physically handle Slytherin's locket having no idea what it is. And then later you discover it's a Horcrux and you're like, what? So again, someone is a seaweed horse, but who and when is the question? I like to think if you try hard enough, we can all be seaweed horses. You know it's going to happen eventually, and you know it's gonna be a big deal. But in what way will it be a big deal? We know from the author that Newt's Patronus is supposed to be super spoilery, whatever it is. So one of our thoughts was, hey, what if it's a Kelpie? And possible, possible, but it really doesn't take into account the shape shiftiness of the Kelpie. That's just not the kind of characteristic that would be well demonstrated in Patronus form. So then the question kind of becomes, is there a person that they might need the Kelpie to pose as? And yes, you're right. There's probably a thousand different ways that this could be put into effect, but we're going to try and apply it to a known problem that Dumbledore and Newt are already trying to overcome the Blood Pact. The Blood Pact, in case you need a refresher, was an agreement made between Dumbledore and Grindelwald where they decided they would never fight one another. And to seal the deal, they both cut their hands, joined them together, and it formed into this Blood Pact. Which again, for some reason, I feel like they always have to be very like, they're at like a jewelry store. There's like a, I don't know, they hold it a certain way. In hindsight, from Dumbledore's perspective, it's probably a better deal if you're Grindelwald than if you're Dumbledore, considering, you know, Dumbledore is not after world domination and Grindelwald is after world domination and Dumbledore is arguably the only person who can stop it. Not that Grindelwald doesn't still recognize Dumbledore as a potential threat to his cause, even if it's not a one-on-one -on -one duel. Who represents the greatest threat to our cause? Help us, Dumbledore. In fact, his whole motivation for literally the first two movies was to track down Credence to have Credence kill Dumbledore so Dumbledore can't interfere with his plans. At the end of Crimes of Grindelwald, Dumbledore says he's unsure as to whether or not he can destroy the Blood Pact, but of course all of us, the audience, are like, oh, come on, man, we have total faith in you. I mean, for one, he's Dumbledore, bestest wizard of them all. Plus, you know, we actually know that they do end up dueling and that Dumbledore wins, so. There's that too. He's obviously going to succeed, right? Yeah, probably not. God 
got you. I know I got you. Even Jay jumped behind the camera a little bit. No, here's the thing. I do not think that he's going to be able to destroy the blood pact because I think that blood magic has proven to be amongst the most powerful kind of magic in the entire world of Harry Potter. I mean, after all, the bond of blood is what literally keeps Harry safe at the Dursleys until he is 17 years old. And that is a magic that is even more powerful than the defenses of Hogwarts. Harry's blood inside of Voldemort literally tethers him to life when he tries to kill him, meaning that it is as powerful as a Horcrux, and we know that Horcruxes are nearly impossible to destroy. And even within Fantastic Beasts, it is a blood curse inside of Nagini that will eventually turn her into a snake permanently. It be powerful stuff, and by all accounts, it seems to have been forged by love, at least on Dumbledore's end of it. But that is the other most powerful form of magic that we are aware of. But yeah, I hear you saying, Ben, there is a duel between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. So, uh, how? Well, what if that's not Dumbledore? You guys with me here? Like, what if this is the reason why Newt is the main character of this entire series. I mean, we just keep wondering ourselves, like, why is Newt the main character of the story when it's very clearly setting up to be the Dumbledore story? Well, what if in this very shape-shifting story, it is Newt disguised as Dumbledore. Here is how I see it playing out and hold on to your butts because it's epic. We know that Grindelwald knows that Dumbledore trusts Newt in a rather unique way. What makes Albus Dumbledore so fond of you? I really couldn't say. I think that at some point in the series, Newt is going to have to face Grindelwald and lose, but the way that he gets away is by casting a Patronus at Grindelwald, thus revealing said Patronus to Grindelwald. Then fast forward to 1945 and it's time for the big event. Newt and Dumbledore are in the arena. Do you think it's gonna happen in like a real big arena, like, you know, gladiators? Because I sure like to think so. Yes! Dumbledore, Grindelwald, Newt. There's an exchange and before you know it, Avada Kedavra! What? No, Newt? How? No! Newt is dead. But then the duel begins in earnest and it's epic, intense, legendary! It's the duel of all duels. The duel that puts Voldemort versus Dumbledore at the Ministry to shame. Grindelwald is totally caught off guard. He has no idea how it's happening, but the blood pact! He has no choice but to believe that Dumbledore found a way around it. But he hasn't. In dire straits, Grindelwald has no choice but to bring out his ace, whatever spell he previously used against Newt, where Newt used his Patronus, and then Newt has to cast his Patronus, and all of a sudden, all of us all at once realize it was Newt the whole time. But wait, then who died? You guys see where I'm going? It's the seaweed horse. Actually kind of sad when you think about it. But the important thing is that the Patronus reveals to Grindelwald and us, the audience, that this has actually been Newt the whole time. But there is no reason why anyone else would ever believe it was anyone but Dumbledore in that duel. Ah, but what of the Elder Wand, you say? Like, isn't Dumbledore the master because he defeated Grindelwald in this very duel? Do you know why I admire you, Newt? More perhaps than any man I know. You do not seek power or popularity. You simply ask, is a thing right in itself? If it is, you do it no matter the cost. This reminds me an awful lot of another guy who has defeated the big bad. Dumbledore says to Harry, those who like you have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. And the thing is, Dumbledore never actually says that he is the master of the Elder Wand. What he says is, well, you know what happened next. I won the duel, I won the wand. I was fit to only possess the meanest of them, the least extraordinary. 
I was fit to own the Elder Wand and not boast of it and not to kill with it. One, the duel does not necessarily mean that he participated in it if he orchestrated it. And ownership of the wand is different from mastery of it. And in case you're wondering, well, does that mean that Harry doesn't ultimately end up being master of the wand because he totally repairs the holly wand with it, which means he has to be the master of the wand? Well, Harry does still truly become master of the Elder Wand, but not because he physically disarms Draco. Instead, I believe it is because he literally faces down death, greets it like an old friend, and then returns from the dead. He becomes master of death and therefore master of the wand. Ah, but Ben still, isn't there that other line from Dumbledore? If you planned your death with Snape, you meant him to end up with the Elder Wand, didn't you? I admit that was my intention, but it did not work as I intended, did it? True, he does say this, but he was also certain that Voldemort would go for the Elder Wand. So effectively what he did was sentence Snape to death, which sucks if you're Snape. But it also means that the Elder Wand was a trap. It's a trap. So that Voldemort would end up with a dud wand. Even Grindelwald tells Voldemort just before he dies, kill me then Voldemort, I welcome death, but my death will not bring you what you seek. There is so much you do not understand. That wand will never ever be yours. Yeah, because what Voldemort doesn't understand is that Dumbledore did not beat Grindelwald. Newt did. Which again, Grindelwald would know because of the Patronus. And personally, I don't think that Newt would have any interest whatsoever in carrying the Elder Wand and allows Dumbledore to protect it for him. And I think this even helps explain why Newt himself would be so absent during the war against Voldemort during Harry's time. It's almost as if he's avoiding conflict altogether in a way to protect the mastery of the wand. And yes, Dumbledore does think that Grindelwald is lying when he tells this to Voldemort. Perhaps that lie to Voldemort Voldemort was his attempt to make amends, to prevent Voldemort from taking the hallow. But let's be real, even Harry doesn't buy this one. Or maybe from breaking into your tomb, suggested Harry, and Dumbledore dabbed his eyes. And I think that's pretty much it. I think that covers all of our bases. Oh, except for the blood pact. What happened to the blood pact? Well, do you remember how I brought up how Slytherin's locket was found earlier in Order of the Phoenix and it ends up being super important later? <coughs> They were crammed with an odd assortment of objects, a selection of rusty daggers, claws, a coiled snakeskin, a number of tarnished silver boxes inscribed with languages Harry could not understand, and least pleasant of all, an ornate crystal bottle with a large opal set into the stopper full of what Harry was quite sure was blood. You, you mean this? Sorry, I forgot that there was a... Do you mean this? This one? It's on sale. Guys, I love this theory so much because one, I think Newt is an elite wizard, literally on par with Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Two, it helps explain why he is the main character of the series, which, you know, it's kind of nice. And three, it makes that exchange between Newt and Dumbledore on the bridge, like very powerful. I cannot move against Grindelwald. It has to be you. Which extra bonus sprinkles on top? I totally think this is the inspiration for how Dumbledore came up with the idea for hiding the Philosopher's Stone inside of the Mirror of Erised. Newt is the one who is able to win the wand. Win it but not use it. Guys, what do you think? Would you be okay with the scenario where this super legendary duel is actually Newt in disguise? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. And guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you would like to see what our theory is on what Newt's Patronus might be, you can check out this video right here. Otherwise, guys, I will see you next time.